All right, I'm going to get started since it's uh, 833 and we have a quiz today. So the faster we end, the better. Um, before I start, I have some announcements. So can, can you all please like be quiet? Um, yeah. I realized that uh, a lot of you haven't been to class yet, so <laughs> you don't understand the procedure. <laughs> I'm just basing that on the density of students. Um, but yeah, usually like we don't talk during class. Uh, that's kind of one of the policies we have here. Um, <laughs> for those of you that are new to this class. <laughs> I just had to say something, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, I will say, though, that this class, the capacity is supposed to be 170, and I don't know how the university plan to do that, because I don't think there is 60 empty seats right now. But yeah, it's the, the wishful thinking, yeah, thinking of Purdue, also known as Purdue Grids. But uh, yeah, so... Um, I do have some announcements since everyone's here. I have decided that I'm no longer responding to emails pertaining to someone that wants to reschedule quizzes. As I kind of said it multiple times that that's why we have a drop quiz. Um, unless I get an email, of course, from the university, you have some athletic event, you're going away for a conference and it's something official from the university or you got sick and you went to the Dean of Students, you gave them the whatever documentation they require, and then they tell me, hey, this person's excused. It's not gonna happen, basically. That's, I've kind of said this multiple times at this point, and I'm still getting emails. So now that everyone's here, hopefully they will stop. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a good lesson, I guess, for all of you, and especially in, the new political climate is that no means no. Um, and and the kind of certain things translate to other realms. Um, so when someone kind of like, we outlined some policies in the syllabus and I'm still getting asked, this is like halfway through the semester, it's kind of like, okay, like, you know. Um, I did promise all of you, if I get 80% uh, 
eighty percent of the evaluations. And like I said, I'm not gonna bribe you to say good things about me. If you want to say bad things, that's like the the point is that basically all of you fill that out. Uh, if eighty percent or more of the class fills that out, I will drop a, I will drop a what a, a second a second quiz which basically puts it at four quizzes out of six, which I don't know how many more excuses you really do need. Um, yeah, that's kind of basically, so I, I, I reiterate that I have told you that I'm willing to drop a second quiz, which I think is already a lot of leeway, given that there's only six of them, um, which means that you have to make attendance 60% of the time uh, what else is there that I wanted to say about this? Yeah, okay. I did want to say something where I might have been the one that messed up. Um, if you if I got an email from any of your like either academic advisors or professors, kind of that you had a conflict for exam two, and I didn't reply, please email me again. I think I replied to all of them. I get a lot of emails per hour and I might have missed one or two and I don't wanna. So basically if you, like I said, for either quizzes or tests, if I get an email from, you're taking a class during the exam, excuse. Uh, Odos, excuse. Athletic event, excuse. Conference, excuse. It's mostly of like, oh, I'm, I'm like an hour before the exam. Oh, I'm feeling sick. I have, uh, I ate too many spicy food then something like that, then it's like, okay, like, uh, so do realize that I, uh, I do understand that there are going to be cases where you are going to have real emergencies and even the, the food one, like, I mean, just email me and I'll see what, especially for a test. I don't know about a quiz. I mean, but it's just, but anyway, um, yeah. That's that's all the announcements I had. Um, the quizzes, you know, are meant to keep you up to date um, because historically students haven't done very well in this class. I, I know you kind of feel very happy about your exams. I will say that uh, I've been teaching this since 2020. So now four years, so I started probably six times and the highest average we've had on an exam has been a 65. So like all of you are doing really well, but like, I'm not like complaining about that, but I'm trying to tell you that from my perspective, I'm having these quizzes so that you all stay up to date and then you all do well on the exam. It's not because I want to for me, it's actually more work because now I have to hand grade these things, which I particularly don't like sitting there going, <laughs> but it's really just to keep you kind of like, uh, and so basically like you having extra exams is not really a good excuse because the whole point is that you don't get behind because things just get worse if you let, if you get, if you get too behind on a class, they just keep getting worse and worse and worse. Um. So this is just to provide kind of like periodic check-ins to make sure that you kind of stay on track. Also, like I said, which I'm not reneging on, 50% this attendance grade. So I I think you've seen two graded quizzes. I'm not like, you know, I'm not being like, I'm being very friendly with the points <laughs> for a reason. That doesn't happen in exams. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so let me just get started. So I'm gonna quickly just summarize what we went over and then we can take a quiz. Speaking of uh, unexcused absences, I'm not gonna be here Friday, so. <laughs> <laughs> so if you come here, there won't be anyone. I've already posted a video on the YouTube for that lecture. Um, Yeah, so yeah, I'm gonna be at DC. Uh, what do you call this? Revising grants and stuff. But all right, let's go over this. So the last few weeks, we've went gone over Laplace transforms, how to go from a function of time to a function of uh, 
in the Laplace domain, and then how to take the inverse Laplace, and then um, circuits in the Laplace domain with zero initial conditions, non-zero initial conditions. And in particular, we said that these things kind of behave like resistor networks uh, algebraically. So it was very easy to solve them. Um, for today, Squiz, I've given you the four initial condition circuits. In an exam, you won't have these. So for now, you don't have to memorize them. Uh, I hope that as you practice, you kind of uh, develop a methodology for not needing these four things. But for now, I'm, I'm giving them to you for this today. Um, and then we went over transfer functions, how to compute the transfer functions, how to use the transfer function, and stability. So just as a reminder, uh, the zero input response means the response to a circuit when the, you zero out the inputs. So if I have a voltage source and I assume there's a zero voltage drop, effectively that behaves like a wire because a wire has zero volt drop. And then if I have a current source and it's got zero amps flowing through it, effectively that behaves like a open because an open has zero current flowing through it basically. And so to find the zero input response, what you would do is you replace all voltage sources with shorts and all current sources with opens. And then you analyze the circuits by assuming that they are being driven by some kind of initial conditions, like the ones I showed there. So, oh, no. Okay, I can fix that. Okay, no, no problems. I just realized your quiz is a lot harder than I intended it to be, but I'll I'll, I'll make it easier again. <laughs> it's not a big deal because since it's only one copy, I can fix it before I put it on the overhead thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So. The, <laughs> okay, so we also kind of talked about the impulse response, like before we talked about Laplace, but then we said if you, there's this nice property of the Laplace transform where if you take the Laplace transform of the convolution of two functions, that's actually the product of the two individual Laplace transforms. So what that means is that the Laplace transform converts convolution on volution to multiplication. So basically this convolution in the time domain becomes a multiplication in the frequency domain. So to find the Laplace transform of the convolution of two functions, you just have to take the product of their Laplace transform. So which makes the analysis a lot easier. So a lot of these convolutions we were doing in the beginning of class, now you can technically just take the two functions, convert them to the Laplace domain, multiply them, and then take the inverse Laplace, and that will give you the solution. Additionally, we said we defined this transfer function as the Laplace transform of the input response or the uh, ratio of the output to the input. Um, or another way to say it is the response whenever the input is one in the Laplace domain or a delta function in the time domain, which is the delta function. Are there questions about this definitions? No. Okay. Then we talked about zeros. We talked about poles. We said that zeros are the roots of the denominator polynomial for the transfer function and the poles are the zeros for the, sorry, the zeros are the for the numerator and the poles are for the denominator. So they're down here. And the reason they have these names for one is because if you evaluate the transfer function at zero, at a zero, you get zero. And if you evaluate a transfer function at a pole, you get infinity. Um, yeah, and then we also define these kind of things as the order of the pole or zero order. And then when we never we say simple poles, we means that the order is one. Okay. Um, 
Okay, once we knew about these poles and uh, and zeros, we said that the location of these poles, so we don't care where the zeros are, tells us a lot about the stability of the system. And, it, and specifically, we said that if the poles sit on the left-hand side, the system is stable. And if they sit on the right-hand side, the system is unstable. So in Bible, stable, uh, stable. And then uh, there are kind of some special poles, which are the ones that sit on the real line. The, the, if the poles sit on the real line, sorry, imaginary line, on the imaginary line, the system is not stable, so it's unstable, but so it's it's not Bible, people bounded input, bounded output stable, it's mm -hmm. unstable, but we call the, if there are all poles on here, we call this marginally stable. And the reason why is because here you go from decaying things. So basically it, on the left, you either have something that decays or something that uh, kind of oscillates to zero. Here, you either have kind of the unit step, which would be kind of at the origin, or you have sines and cosines. And then here you go to basically things that go out to infinity or they oscillate and become bigger and bigger and bigger. And so this, this kind of line represents that transition between things that blow up and things that uh, go to zero. Uh, these are just things that stay the same or, or the transfer functions that stay the same. And so that's why it's marginally stable. So it's kind of like that uh, transition region from unstable from stable to unstable. Okay. We will be talking more about this and we haven't quite gone over it, but there's actually a, a, a very nice thing about uh, this uh, transfer function. And I think Monday's lecture is gonna be all about this. The transfer function, when we evaluate it at, at at the on the imaginary line. So if we evaluate, so if you think of H of S on the imaginary plane, when you evaluate it on this line, so H of J omega, we call that the frequency response. And it actually has some connections to phasers. So what you've been actually solving when you solve phasers is actually for the frequency response at a point on this line. So this transfer function actually gives us the phasor uh, response for all frequencies, essentially. And here I'm gonna give you kind of a sketch as to why that is. Um, so in particular, if we, if we let's say have uh, an input that looks like cosine omega t, right? Then the Fourier, trans oh, sorry, the Laplace transfer of the cosine omega t is just, oh, this should just be one, sorry, one. So it's just one half over S minus J omega plus one half uh, S plus J omega. So here you kind of have Euler's identity. And then here we use the this table property to get the two terms. Is that clear how I got that? So when we want to find the output Y sub S, we have basically uh, Y sub S is going to be equal to h of s times x of s, which is really equal to uh, h of s times 0.5 divided by s minus j omega plus 0.5 h of s s plus j omega. So um, when we did our inverse of plus transforms, how did we find, so, so we said that we would basically find a decomposition of this thing in terms of like a zero, that's the, the Bermuda triangle. So okay, a zero plus the sum a one of S plus some whole, P i over all i plus a k s plus j omega plus a k plus one. 
S plus J or minus J omega, sorry. So what we said when we were trying to do these inverse Laplace transforms was that we, we, we would basically find all of the roots of the response and then we would do uh, long divisions to get kind of the decomposition. Now, if we want to find these two coefficients, AK and AK plus one, how do we do that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So to find AK, we would multiply this by uh, S plus J omega, right? And then, or sorry, S minus J omega, not plus J omega. And then we would basically evaluate at uh, J omega. So what's gonna happen? Well, when I evaluate, when I when I factor this into here and I evaluate this S as J, J omega, I'm gonna get zero. And then for this one, the S minus J omegas will cancel and I'm actually just gonna get 0.5 H of J omega or does that make sense? So basically, AK is actually equal to 0.5 H of J omega. And then I can do the same thing for the negative J omega. So then I'm going to get here 0.5 H of negative J omega. Um, and it turns out because all of these circuits are, have real responses, the H of J omega is equal to the conjugate of H of negative J omega. And so as a result, um, these two things uh, are conjugate of each other. <clears throat> so now we can kind of go to the next uh, slide. So basically, like I said, we, we this should be a one, this should be a one. What we have here, once we multiply everything out, is that we have to factor this out into a form that looks like this. And then we have these two. And to find these two, when we use our method, we get that AM plus 1 and AM plus 2 are just 0.5 H of J omega. And since these two things, like I said, are conjugate, you have here kind of the conjugation of the two. You can write it in polar form. And then you get an expression that looks like this. When you inverse Laplace this, what you actually get is that the output looks like this. So it's just H of J omega rescaling the cosine plus the angle of H of J omega. So effectively, if I input a cosine, what I get out is that cosine multiplied by the magnitude of the transfer function uh, plus, and shifted by the angle of the transfer function evaluated at omega, at J omega. Go ahead. It's, it's towards the top of this slide. You mean this? Yes. No, it's your job. It's your yeah, so Euler's identity says that H of J omega T equals to cosine omega T plus I sine T, and then E to the negative J omega T equals cosine omega T minus I sine I should say J because we're in engineering world, omega T. And so when you add, add these two, the signs cancel and you're left with two cosine and then you divide by two. And then that gives you the, that cosine is actually equal to this. And then from there, you just take the Laplace of the exponentials to get these two terms. Once you have that to find the response, you multiply by the transfer function, and then you do the partial fraction decomposition. But when you do that, what you find is that the coefficients are actually just half the transfer function evaluated at J omega and half the transfer function evaluated at negative J omega. But then like a long story short, what that basically tells you is that for any frequency, what the, the, the steady state response or the response uh, of the circuit, all it will do is it will take your input, you scale it by, by the magnitude of the frequency response and shift it in time by the phase of the uh, frequency response evaluated at that omega. So what that basically means is like before when you were solving circuits, you were like, you were giving kind of that the, 
the input was cosine 60t. And then you would solve a circuit. And then somebody said, you know what? Never mind. I made it 120t. And then you have to solve the circuit again. What this is basically telling you is that once you have this transfer function uh, in terms of phasers or the steady state response, you don't have to solve it again. You already know what the steady state response will look like because uh, it's just any for any frequency, you just multiply by the magnitude of that frequency response and you and you shift it by that amount. So now you this gives you all of the information about how this circuit will in the steady state react to to any given input frequency. And I say in the steady state because the natural or transient response that can look like anything and we haven't really looked at it but typically in engineering we don't really worry about this so or in electrical engineering we don't really worry about this we just think about this a lot okay um so transfer functions so let's say we have kind of this is our input and the uh, this is our output. What would be the transfer function for this circuit? Can anyone, or how would I find the transfer function for this circuit? Sure, set V in as one. Yes, so S, one over SC. Okay, and then, so what is the current coming out of the circuit? I equals to, Yeah, so one over Z, which is just one over R plus SL plus one over SC. And that's it, that's your transfer function. So basically that's that's all you have to do. So you either set your source to one or you try to find the output over the input. You convert the, the system to the Laplace domain and then algebraically you find the quantity you need uh, by treating every element like you would treat a resistor algebraically. Yeah? Could you just uh, equivalently do everything with time domain and uh, convert your answer? You can, but you can't, I guess. I, I guess you could derive a differential equation where you have a delta of t in the front. In the, the, the main issue is you can't really solve this. So you would have to kind of derive the differential equation and then Laplace the differential equation because the an input of La, of a delta function doesn't really make sense. Uh, okay, non-zero initial conditions. So okay, so let's say you were asked to solve this circuit. How much time do we have? Actually, no, never mind. We're out of time. Uh, Yeah. So, Thank <laughs> you. 